Welcome to the Couples Expert Podcast with Stuart Fensterheim, LCSW, your source for the latest tips and practical down-to-earth advice on creating emotionally connected, thriving relationships. Now, here's Stuart. Welcome back. This is Stuart Fensterheim, the Couples Expert, and welcome to the Couples Expert Podcast. This is the show that's all about relationships, how to have a good relationship, and more importantly, what not to do to have your relationship be something where you feel very alienated and alone from your partners. We all want to have that special relationship with that significant person in our life. Well, what we're going to be doing today is talking a lot about connecting, how to have fun, laughing, and really just about being best friends with our partners. The cure for that is this show and the guests that I bring on to help all of you really feel that love and devotion that you each have for one another. First thing I want to do, though, is apologize to all of you, because we've been in the middle of our uh, infidelity series, and because of the uh, time of year it is, I went on vacation. I went on a cruise with my wife so that I, too, can have an experience of connecting with those people in my life that are close and important to me. And we went on a nice trip to, we went to France and Italy, and really just enjoyed being together with no cell phones and no ability to have anyone get hold of us. Just think of that. How wonderful would that be to really be able to devote that kind of time to your relationship? Well, I chose to do that. It took a while for us to get there, but we did. And if you want to see some of the photos and some of the really exciting things we did, you can go on my Facebook business page, and I've posted some of those photos. But let's talk more about today and my special guest, who is Jim Thomas. Jim Thomas is a trainer and supervisor in the emotionally focused therapy field. What is so special about this for me is, is I've been doing these podcasts now for about eight months. And when you do them, you're never quite sure who listens and whether you're doing any good. And I just recently saw that we've now had over 6,000 downloads. That's pretty exciting for me, someone who really wants to get my message of love and connection out to those of you that need that and want to hold on to that aspect of your relationship and making your relationship something where you feel a connection with the world and know that you're in the right relationship. We, as therapists, go out in the field. We choose to go to certain specializations. I chose, as most of you know, emotionally focused therapy. I went to a training back in November, I believe it is, in 2013 or 14, where I first met Jim. Jim was a presenter in a conference that I went to called Broken Bonds. And, and what it was about was really dealing with relationship injuries. So when I began to start thinking about my podcast and the series on infidelity that I'm doing, Jim really was that person I wanted to bring on, but quite honestly, wasn't quite sure he would have the time or whether or not that there would be other things that he'd be so involved with. And when I reached out to Jim and rather quickly he said, yes, that he'd come on this podcast to help my community. I knew what I felt about Jim was accurate, that this is a man that doesn't just talk the talk, but walks the walk. As most of you know, or anyone who's been involved with the field of addictions, what that means is that Jim lives what he says, that his words are part of who he is as a human being, and his willingness to take time and set it aside for us just tells me what kind of a good guy he is. So I want to just welcome Jim to the Couples Expert Relationship Podcast. And thank you, Jim, very much for being here. That's very kind of you. Thank you. You're welcome. I always like doing the walk the walk kind of thing. 
you know, walk. All right. I don't know if you know that sort of from the essay community, it's, you know, walking, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's very nice. I think that's powerful for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, on basketball, we used to say you go to the gym to play and somebody would say, put me on your team, you know, mm-hmm. bragging. We'd say, well, you got the talking part down. <laughs> And now let's see how you can play. <laughs> if we win, we get to stay on the court down here at the rec center. That's, That's true. Actually, I may use that if you're okay with that, because we're recording right now. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. I, I yeah. like that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, you learn in life, right? That. Yeah. Well, in marriage, you know, and even for us couples therapists that, uh, you know, my wife and I, we've had to walk the walk together in a lot of ways. We came out of families that weren't super functional relationally. Mm-hmm. I don't think either of us felt particularly seen or understood as children and teenagers by our immediate family. And you come into marriage and you bring all that stuff with you, right? You, what did you learn? What did you learn? What did you watch? I often say to my clients, how often did you see affection demonstrated between your parents or other adult couples in your life growing up, right? Did you see them resolve conflict? Did you see, did you see your father cry or do you remember your parents talking well of each other when the other parent wasn't around? <laughs> that's right? a good, that's actually a great one. When they're not around is, is really the key because uh-huh. you get to know really what's in someone. And what's interesting for me is that looking at your past and your parents' relationships, I think is really important, but even more about the whole communication and vulnerability piece is Mm -hmm. did they even talk about anything? Because I have a number of couples now that that's the bigger issue is that they don't even know how to start the conversation. They would love to have the conversation, but they don't know how they don't have the words for the conversation. Yeah. I had a couple in my office just a couple of weeks ago and they've been doing some really good work and starting to get vulnerable and sex came up. And the male partner is, this is so uncomfortable. I can talk about sex in the way where I ask you to do something different physically. But this thing where we're talking emotionally about you and me together sexually, wow, this is really, really making me nervous. Right. And what is that experience like? Mm -hmm. The sexual emotional experience. Right. And that vulnerability. And and maybe the first question we should talk, because, you know, part of why I had you come on is really to help my community really deal with these issues of not just so much infidelity, because I think infidelity has sort of an angle to it that sometimes is not real clear. But it's more about the feelings of betrayal and, uh, and being unimportant. And just so, and I've talked a lot about emotionally focused therapy, but I'd like you maybe to give a sort of a brief statement about what you see as the difference between someone going through emotionally focused therapy and other forms of marriage counseling. What do you see as the real salient difference? Let me do that. But when you were talking about betrayal and trust, and then maybe this will lead into how EFT is different. It strikes me, and I often think about and look at couples when they come into my office, that trust is perhaps combined with vulnerability. Trust is the most salient, most important element in a marriage. And that, you know, 100% trust is hard to achieve. And it's an aspirational goal that requires a lot of openness and a lot of vulnerability. And betrayal and infidelity affairs things like addiction, and they are, if we view trust on a continuum, this is where we're moving into extreme distrust and distrust that causes injuries to the bond between two people. Oh my gosh, you had an affair. Oh, you're lying to me about the affair now. I'm losing absolute trust in you. The one person I thought would always be there for me. The one person that I had this emotional bond with that was going to travel through life with me, that we would have each other's backs. You went 
and you got emotionally or sexually intimate with another person, or you were so absorbed in that addiction that you lied to me about it or hid it from me and you went towards that addiction over me or you, you know, whatever that thing is, right? And I think that can lead into the EFT talk because one of the key differences between emotionally focused therapy and other therapies is we view the marriage as an emotional bond between two people. And we believe there's plenty of science to support this. So that's one thing I think listeners need to know is EFT has science supporting it both in how we understand the work we're doing, that we're working with people's attachment to each other, this bond that I'm talking about. And we also have outcome studies. We're up to about 32 outcome studies now. And what that means for the lay person is this is when a therapy is studied in a way to show does this therapy itself actually work. Unfortunately, couples therapy results outside of an evidence-based model are pretty poor. We have maybe 30, 35 percent of couples getting better. And I think between you and I, Stuart, there's a lot of bad couples there <laughs> that listeners need to be careful about. So EFT, we're not going in and teaching communication skills, for example. This is probably the most popular and unfortunate type of couples therapy out there where highly distressed couples or couples who've grown apart or couples coming, you know, dealing with the impacts of something like an affair or addiction are taught these communication skills. And it's as if we were a bit like your dog over there in the corner, right? You can teach your dog because your dog wants your attention. Mm -hmm. And if you give it some rewards, you can teach your dog to do some pretty nifty tricks or stay by your side when you need it or be therapeutic in session. Right. We're more complicated than that. <laughs> and when we try to teach people these communication skills, people who've been in therapy know this. They practice a communication skill in the session and they go home. And when they're scared or angry, it all gets thrown out the window. A couple recently I was working with at the end of the treatment said, you know, we did three other therapies. They all led with communication. We finished with communication here. Right. We finished learning to talk to each other in a whole different way. We don't talk to each other with our heads anymore. We talk to each other with our hearts, and that's made all the difference. And if we're talking about trust violations, uh -huh. to be able to say, oh, I'm going to use I statements. To, <laughs> to, I'm going to say, well, I really think you really are a jerk and asshole, and how dare you do this to me? I've used I. Yes. I'm, I must be communicating right. That's right. How, how can you really communicate if you don't understand your trigger? That's right. So this is another and part that that's the issue. different. Yeah, one of the, another thing that's different, we'll call it EFT, this is Emotionally Focused Couples Therapy. The main developer of the model is Dr. Sue Johnson, whom I always want to mention. I'm so grateful for her that she found this model, and she found it by listening to couples. She found it by asking couples when she was studying for her doctorate and filming all her sessions. She started asking them what were the most meaningful parts of our sessions, and they all came back to places where couples were exploring these these important vulnerable emotions like sadness and hurt and fear and joy and longing and were getting vulnerable and she said whoa maybe all this communication skills negotiation bargaining you know you're from mars i'm from venus uh learn a different language of love that all of this stuff is misdirected that it's really rather simple if it's an emotional bond between two people, what makes a bond feel the safest and most secure? Well, with humans, it's when we can see into each other. That's what intimacy is, right? Into me see. Right. Oh, I, I like trust that. you not. I like right? that. I hadn't heard that before. <laughs> you can quote me. <laughs> okay. Into, into me see. And when I feel safe to let you in and you feel safe to let me in. And when you let me in, I show interest and care. Right. We're sharing our hearts. This is at the root of the bond. And that really the, the key communication skill is vulnerability or to show our vulnerability to our partner and to find ways to do that where we're not caught up in like a negative cycle or pattern. Look, how many couples that have got caught in an affair, they got there because there was a susceptibility. A couple have been caught in like a negative pattern, a negative cycle, a negative dance. Your listeners know what I mean. Like you're in a bad play mm -hmm. and every night you come home and you say to yourself, tonight 
I'm going to be different with my partner. Uh Uh-oh, an hour later, I'm saying my same line from the play. I'm getting caught up in that same fight or argument, or I'm shutting down and avoiding. No matter what I do. No matter what, I get caught up in these negative cycles. And EFT, we don't try to talk people out of these negative cycles, scold them or shame them, or try to explain, you know, here's how you can get out of your negative cycle. We go in there and explore it with. EFT therapists are like companions and guides, and we turn people towards what's happening between them and say, let's look at what's happening here. What is this? How does it feel to be caught up in this? How does it feel to be so distant from your partner? How does it feel to be coming here when you've just found out they had an affair? What's it like for you that your partner's recovering from addiction, but while they were drinking heavily, they did some pretty bad things to you? They said some pretty mean things. What's that like? We bring it to the surface and explore it with people and empower people through deeper understanding of themselves and what's happening between them. And then if we add betrayal to it, I think there's a couple of elements that I'd like to sort of explore with you. And I don't want to run away from the into me see comment you just made, because I think one of the things I talk a lot about with my couples and with my listeners is about the whole experiential piece of emotionally focused therapy. And you and I, as we sat here, just had an experience. You use that acronym. And as I sat here, I had an experience emotionally about Mm -hmm. it, both Mm -hmm. loving sort of the acronym. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I think for me, when I think about having a relationship with my wife or couples that I've seen over and over again, if you can't see into your partner, if you really don't have that, I can see into you. I know your guts. I know who you are. I know what I can count on because I know the things you show me, the things you don't show anyone else, which is part of the betrayal when you have sort of these emotional affairs. I can then relax Yes, I can let my guard down. I can let my guard down, do the same, but even more so, I can relax and Mm -hmm. know who you really are. Right. And if I don't really know who you are, I have never have that security. Right. So that if I can into you see, intimacy, and I know that we can be vulnerable with one another, if there's a need that's not being met in this relationship, you. you'll know, and that's you'll right. take that risk. That's and, right. You, you know, my wife and I, we, we had our public vows, and we had our private vows in mm-hmm. our marriage. And one of our private vows was that we didn't know this is 30 years ago. 20, well, 20, 28 years ago, we've been together 30 years. Um, we didn't know that uh, what what would the next decades bring and would one of us be tempted or find ourselves in a situation where we started feeling feelings for another person. And our vow was to tell each other if that happened, we didn't promise each other it wouldn't happen because we're human. We can fall in love unexpectedly. This is one of the reasons and we can become sexually attracted to a degree where it starts to become a compulsion or we can find ourselves just in a situation like on a business trip or something, right? Hanging out with the guys in the company, we're all at this bar and this woman's flirting. And the next thing you know, the guy finds himself up in a hotel room. So there's a lot of ways people stumble into this. So what we did was we said, if we start to find ourselves in that situation, we'll come home and talk about it. And that means also that I have to let you see into me. I have to take the risk of showing vulnerable parts of myself and often affairs are sideways moves, I call them. I'm not able to be seen or feel comfortable with you or to feel like you, you you know, when I come home, you don't smile anymore. You know, when I come home, you don't seem like you like me anymore. But that woman at work. You always smile and talk about. And and she, when I show up at work or when I show up at the happy hour or when I show up on, on business, I come by the and she waits on tables where she's nice to me and she shows interest in me. And I make a sideways move towards that intimacy there, which ironically has less risk because it's an affair. Uh, in the beginning, 
I had telling myself I can end it. I'm telling it doesn't matter. I'm not. It's like the airplane conversation where you can open up and tell somebody your whole mm-hmm. life story on an airplane, knowing when you get off, you're not going to see them again. But tell my life story to my partner. That's real risk. But how do you go from something like that type of experience, whether someone comes home and says this thing happened, I cheated. Mm -hmm. And then you have the issue. And I always look at these things from a systemic or system standpoint. So we have a couple now that has this in their experience. and, And you hear all the time the person about affairs that once you have one, it'll, you never can know, and it changes everything. So once a cheater, always a cheater kind of statements. Mm-hmm. How is a couple, how should a couple cope with those aspects, that aspect that now we have this as part of our history? And well, be able it, to then relax and feel secure again. Yes, they've got to go through a, a process together. You know, the fortunate thing, you know, when I'm talking about this agreement, my wife and I made the the, the key piece is if we started to have those feelings towards another person, we'd talk about it. So that's one thing I think is key. And and maybe, you know, you wouldn't even have to say like, oh, I have a crush on the, the, the lady that comes in and does the sales calls at my office. But I could say, huh. What's happening here? What's the susceptibility to having a crush on the, this man or woman in my life? What's missing in my marriage? Can I find a way to talk about what's missing? I haven't had an affair. I don't need to hurt. I don't need right. to, you know my wife or my husband to wonder what is he got better pecs than me? You know, is he taller? Is he funnier? Is she cuter? But I can listen to myself and say, what's happening here? What's getting me feeling and looking outside my marriage and bring that home? Now, if an affair has already happened, you're mentioning, Stuart, are really, you know, it, it is better in the end to own it and say, I strayed, than it is to lie about it. That lying about straying, I call the second betrayal. And you and I have probably both seen this in our office, that when people are recovering from affairs, often partners are more upset emotionally and feel more fear and panic about I started to figure it out, Stuart. I think I knew that you were cheating. And I came and said to you, you're cheating, aren't you? And you looked at me with that same face and said no and reassured me. Now, how do I ever trust that again? Right. Because here you are now telling me it's okay, It's over. I would never do that again. The process that this earning trust back, I think that's something we could spend an hour talking about. And I think that's a lot about forgiveness, and it's a lot about feeling, I think we're back to the the issue of vulnerability, because what I talk a lot about, again, post-affairs, is very different than preventative affairs, so I think we have to separate that out. Can we talk about forgiveness? Because I think this is, there's a lot of, there's some good stuff out there on the internet, you know, about forgiveness, and there's some bad stuff, because... Uh, may I finish just one thing yeah. first, oh, yeah, if please, I can, yeah. which is which goes right to the heart of that in terms of forgiveness. And then I'm going to let you take it because yeah. you, you have yeah. more expertise in this than I do. In terms of what I tell people, forgiveness and apology go together. Mm-hmm. And, but it can't just be a simple apology. It has to be a vulnerable apology. That's right. It has to be an apology where you feel like the person's guts are on the floor. That if you have an experience where the person really recognizes, number one, why they did what they did and the absolute impact on you. And when I say guts on the floor, I I don't mean the guy is like, you know, totally a mess. But there has to be a sense that this person really, you know, it's interesting it went to guys because it's not just guys. Um, And that is an important thing. Yeah, well, that's important. What, women are catching up. I mean, one of the from liberation and empowerment, a side effect is the rate of female infidelity in heterosexual marriages has been uh, rising modestly. I mean, the good news about infidelity is it's not as common as most websites will say. You right. know, that you'll see 50, 60, 70 percent of couples have affairs and it's just not. It's probably more in the 25 to 30% over the lifetime of a marriage. It's still too high, but 
So back to forgiveness and apologies, you were saying. Uh, that basically, if you have a true apology where you feel your partner truly understands what they've done, has a good sense of why they did what they did, and of the impact it had of their behavior on themselves, and more importantly, on you, and how it shattered sort of the emotional vulnerability needs. If you have that type of dialogue, I think forgiveness is a lot easier. Yeah, I think it's something, yeah, we maybe need a new word for it. Something that combines like forgiveness with integrating the experience and reconnecting. Forgiveness to me, it sounds like an act, like I'm in church or something. It's, and I'm, you know, or, you know, my friend made fun of me at school and then for, I forgive them. They apologize. I really like what you're saying. I, the way I think about it, well, let's, let's speak to your listeners. So if there's someone out there and they had an affair or their partner or someone who had an affair and maybe they're trying to work this out, a place we'll see people spinning is the person who had the affair keeps saying, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And then they'll say, like, you know, it's been three years I've been telling you I'm sorry. For three years I've been letting you read my texts and you have all my passwords and you know where I am all the time and we have an ankle monitor around my heart. You know, <laughs> you, you, can, you can trust me, right? And I keep apologizing. And when that's happening, I think there's a key piece missing, which you're talking about. The way I say it is, if, if I injured you, an apology without empathy is for me. Mm -hmm. An apology with empathy is for you. An apology with empathy and vulnerability is for us. And I think this is something EFT therapy can help with is people come in to therapy when there's been an affair and they want to, or a couple without therapy, they want to heal it very quickly. And there is a rush to these big dramatic apologies before I really understand what it did to you. I just feel bad about what I did. I want to get back in your good graces. And so those types of apologies miss that key component that you're talking about, which is that real felt heartfelt sense of what did this do to you, my lover, my partner, my friend, but to know that I did this, how you found out, which often includes that second betrayal that I might have lied about it. What has this done to you? How scared are you that I could do this again? What's happening to you when you have to go back and go back through our history and say you were with her for 18 months? When you would step out at the holidays, were you texting her? That one weekend when you went into work, were you with her? What's that like? What's it going to be like for you when our kid is getting married? And on the wedding day, you're thinking about affairs. Can I have the courage and the empathy to go in and find out about that? The hurt right. and the fear and the healthy anger, right? The, hey, never again, buddy. I need to know you won't do this again. Now, that is mucky, that painful stuff. And a lot of times when people are apologizing, they're doing it in a way where they're saying to their partner, let me off the hook now. I've told you I won't do it again. I mean it. I don't want to know about that pain. I don't want to know how I scared you. I don't want to know how it's still alive for you. And the paradox is the best way out of this emotional purgatory with your partner is to go towards their pain right. and go towards their it. fear. Yeah, go towards it and be in it and help them no longer be alone with it because otherwise they've got to go talk to their friends about it, family or a therapist, and it's nothing. They don't have the healing capacity for the affair that you, the person who had the affair, has. But, boy, that's hard to move towards somebody who's angry with you and hurt, and, and EFT helps pace that process. Yeah. Why I love EFT is because of all these things that you're saying and the experience that I've had with a number of couples. And this is a tough sort of balancing act because I've actually had couples say to me toward the end of that process, <laughs> this is really hard even for me to say it's sitting here. Mm. The affair was the best thing that ever happened to our marriage. Right. And I have had people say that to me. And yes. the reason for that is that if you really take it step by step, before you talk about the affair in a very specific, with the apology and the forgiveness, talking about what were the things that were missing. And if you, to get a 
couple to then have a secure relationship in spite of an affair. It's that we've dealt with the missing components that we've never had, even before the affair. And now I really feel you. I don't feel alone. And one of the things I'm always talking to couples about now is that lonely isolation and that how do we avoid that? Because unless you don't have an experience with your partner where you feel alone, if you have that, you are so ready for an affair. That's so, right. I, uh, yeah, you know. Because we never want best, people to feel like it's okay that it happened, but. Yeah, the, the best antidote to an affair is closeness with your partner. The, the more I know my wife over the years, the more I understand those things that are raw spots for her, her sensitivities, things she brought from childhood where she got harmed or in early adulthood and relationships before me. The more I can see her heart, what we know from science is she actually becomes a part of me. You know, there's a thing the neuroscientists talk about that we've looked for self in the wrong places. We're always looking for self inside one person. But our central nervous systems are open systems. We co-create each other daily. We co-regulate or dysregulate each other. And as I get closer and less isolated and I have a stronger bond, a secure bond with my wife, she's literally inside me. So if I'm at a bar or at a work function or somewhere and somebody starts to flirt with me, she's in there too. I can feel her and I I don't want to hurt her. And I, I send out some kind of signal that says not interested and it's coming from that bond, right? So I think what you're saying is powerful. I can imagine some listeners, maybe if they just have, you know, they're really struggling with recovery from an affair that they'd say, what, am I supposed to be to blame, you know, because our marriage wasn't great, then it was okay for them to go, you know, cheat on me. And I know you and I are not saying that. But but that's the vulnerability he, where they're at is the fear piece. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. Will it ever, ever be okay again? That's right. And, and what, the promise of EFT, of when we do this work well, and we do it in sequence, we don't rush to, to solutions. We don't rush to cheap forgiveness or, you know, a shallow forgiveness is a stronger bond than ever. Like like little kids who break their bones. Right. If you set the bone right, it, it, it heals back stronger than ever. EFT excels at taking those things that drove you apart and understanding them in a way that brings you closer together than ever. And affairs is an example of that or recovering from addiction or workaholism. I mean, I know a lot of folks out there listening in today's corporate world, it's very tempting to work 60, 70 hours a week. And that's damaging to a relationship. Yeah, I'm having another guest on shortly that's talking that, yeah. specifically about the entrepreneur piece yeah. of how do you deal with that. One of the things that I want to go back to what you were Please. saying in terms of being in that bar and your wife being inside of you and, you know, what do you do? Because I think what people don't do enough of is that when they're there and you were talking even earlier about, you know, we all can be in vulnerable positions. We can be at a work function before you know it, you're in a hotel room. And then before you know it, you've now betrayed. It's how do you dig deep? And this is the vulnerability, not only with each other, but I think, being vulnerable within yourself, how do we recognize we're in an unsafe situation and run like hell away? Yeah, get away. I don't go. Yeah, don't go to strip clubs because, you know, you're on a corporate trip or at a convention and a bunch of people at the convention say we're going to a strip club. Well, you know, you're in a committed relationship. What are you doing in a strip club, right? And don't sit and, you know, talk and flirt. Don't do those things. And yeah, you're right. Run like hell. Put yourself in healthy, good situations. Right. That that's yeah, right. I was a crisis. I was a crisis counselor in an emergency room for a number of years at Desert Samaritan Hospital, and I was, you know, as an emergency room counselor, we deal with all the, you know, the drunks and everyone that's coming in. And I'm walking into this room, door shut, just me and this person to do this crisis evaluation. We did pretty routine ones. And this pretty attractive lady is in her gown and she's flashing me. Doors closed. 
No one's coming in because I'm doing this assessment. I had to, on my own, go, wait a minute. This is not okay. That's right. And number two, even if I had the inkling of it, I have to live with myself and the impact on my family. I made an excuse to get the hell out of the room. That takes a lot of strength. That and not strength. everyone, restraint and strength and emotional wherewithal and being able to foreshadow what's going to happen next. And not all of us are that good at seeing We're, the consequences. I, I, yeah, I think what you're talking you know, about, it's, it, it's it an interesting like, thing, like emergency training and knowing the right thing to do, you know, and my, my wife and I were walking in, in Golden, Colorado, along the, the creek there, and we heard screaming. And on one side of the creek, there were 50 people watching. On our side, there were 20 people watching. And I said, honey, get your phone out and get ready to call 911. And I went down closer to the creek, and there's a look to me be about a 55-year-old man screaming for help. And he was caught in the rapids, and the, the river was really high, and he looked like he was going to drown. And, and she called, and we found out later we're the only ones who called. But I have emergency training. She has emergency training. So it's like creating an emergency training protocol in your marriage and practicing. And I think some of the things like talking about those situations, I talk often about my wife. She's in all my conversations. She comes up a lot because she's such a part of me. I wear my wedding ring proudly. I, I'm looking to foster my bond with her. I think of our relationship like tending a garden or something, you know, taking care of like a farmer, you know, you sometimes you got to go out there and plow the soil. You got to go in and, you know, plow the soil. You've got to fertilize. You got to water. You got to work at this stuff. And um, and you're not embarrassed to admit that. Yeah. I'm proud and us of guys have a real issue with that. You know, another one us guys have, Stuart, I see this all the time. You probably see it. Guys have warm, affectionate thoughts or, or even, you know, like, hey, I think my wife looks hot today or something. Uh, whatever it is, but we don't say it. We have these private conversations in our heads with our wives. <laughs> right. I, I tell her you, you're feeling close to her today. You know, <laughs> it's a radical <laughs> idea. Like, hey, and say I feel lucky to be with you. You know, to, I mean, I, how many times I'll be in session and a guy will say to me, "Yeah, we're doing better." Well, how do you know? Well, this weekend we were sitting on the back porch and I just thinking how lucky I was to be with her and. I said, what was it like when you told her? He says, tell her. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, tell her? <laughs> Don't have a private moment. I call no, it, she'll win. She'll, couple, beat me. she'll know me too well. <laughs> have a couple moments. And I think the other biggest preventer of these betrayals is to seek first, when lonely, sad, or scared, seek first your partner. If your partner's not available, go to your best friend or family member in an appropriate way. But seek first to ease the loneliness, the sorrow, the pain, the fear, the shame with your partner. If it's too scary to do it with your partner first, talk to somebody about how can I talk to my partner about this. But don't go to people. If you're having lunch and let's say you're, you're heterosexual or if you're, or if you're gay and lesbian, you know, you're having lunch with, with the same gender or you're heterosexual and you're having lunch with someone of the opposite gender for whatever reason, business or something. And you start talking about your loneliness, pain and sorrow with them. And you wouldn't tell your spouse about it. Run. Like you said, get out of that bit, that meeting and go home and share with your partner what you found yourself wanting to share with that person. Find these vulnerabilities inside and share them. And the big bonus is you get to be closer. You get to relax, like you said. You get to avoid the damage of affairs and stuff. You get to learn about yourself. And you find out that your heart, I say to men all the time, your heart is your ally, not your enemy. When you hide your heart, that's the problem. It's not your emotions in your heart that's the problem. It's that you're hiding them from your partner. And you talk about the most romantic Sexually exciting thing for a lot of women in heterosexual relationships is when their partner gets vulnerable. Yes. And that's the time bump, then they so. have most their their clothes on. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. The right. most intimate times is when your clothes are on and yeah. you're sharing those things. And I think part of the challenge here is I don't know if it's it's a gender specific or not, but 
people think that when they share, they have to share these big things. Mm -hmm. I say make the small things matter, and then you'll have the big things. That's right. Like when's when's the last time you turned to your wife and said, thanks for doing my laundry? Yeah. She does it all the time. She yeah. probably doesn't even want or need you to tell her, but you telling her tells her she matters. And when's the last time you said to your wife when you got home, you know, today I was thinking about you. Let me let me say a couple of things. That I know we'll okay. start with this. Think about time. Yeah, try to I don't think do it's that. a gender thing particularly. I think it's easy to it does play out this way a lot of times where men in heterosexual relationships tend to be a little more emotionally play it close to the vest. Don't open up as much. Don't want to talk about issues and emotions in the relationship. And but it can be flipped. And I don't think men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Mm-hmm. I think we're from Earth. Another thing, you know, I, I've been doing, I really love, and your listeners need to know is out there, is sometimes busy professionals, if you travel a lot, or, you know, you're, you're dealing with something like an affair, to string together, you know, 10, 15 therapy sessions with some therapist, and then you're out of town for three weeks, and, you know, it's like seems to take forever, is I do these couples intensives. Mm-hmm. Couples fly into Colorado, they meet with me for two days. And we're stringing those sessions together and we don't have life getting in the way. And I, look, I can't guarantee results. It's, it's therapy and people have to do the work. And what I promise is I'll show up and I'll show up vulnerably and I'll show up focused. And I find people getting to some really good places in these, these intensives. And if folks are interested in that, I know you do this type of work too. They wanted to talk to me about that work. They can go to engagingtherapy.com. One of the things that you know, Jim, is that on my show notes, I'm going to be putting your website, how to get hold of you, and a lot of information. And, okay. if, and, if, yeah. you, and if you have a little clip on the intensive that you want to share with me, I can put that on there as well. Right. But they want people to know that there's help out there. I yes. think going to EFT therapists gives you one big advantage, a step ahead, which is EFT therapists get to the heart of the matter. They get to the heart of the matter, though, in a way where there's some nice pacing. You're not like thrown into the deep end of the swimming pool or something where all of a sudden you have to get raw and vulnerable in session number two. We explore with people. We meet people where they are. We meet people with their history, their emotional strategies. We help people fight these negative cycles start exploring our vulnerabilities with each other and make sense of it before we go into deeper work. But that deeper work, beyond that deeper work, I want listeners to know there's like a promised land for couples. There's a promised land where you feel safer with each other, more secure with each other. Yes, you'll still have arguments. You'll still have tips. You'll still have disagreements. But the power of connection and closeness becomes more compelling than the fear and anger that comes with conflict and distance. That's the core difference between a happy couple and an unhappy couple is when my wife and I get into a conflict, being close to her is more compelling than my fear and anger about our conflict and distance. And so I find a way or she finds a way to come back to that place. It's like the Rumi quote when Rumi said, out beyond right and wrong, there is a field. I'll meet you there. Oh, I couples like that. create that field and that field it becomes more and more compelling over time i am closer to my partner my wife today than i've ever been and i do say those things and they come from my heart thank you for that thank you for taking care of this thanks for thinking of me thanks for being there thanks like for being s- in my life yes i like to say to her i am so glad to have a partner and even more glad that that partner is you you know what's really cool about what you just said is I'm thinking today Arizona State University starts next week or this week. I just moved my last child mm. into her dorm or on Saturday. Congratulations on that big transition. It's a huge one, and there's a lot of loss that comes with That's that. That's right. That's right. And I found this weekend that my wife and I were arguing more than we had in a very long time. Mm. And I was trying to understand that. And what I realized is it's fear of what if we're not as close as we are now. Mm -hmm. 
six weeks from now, six months from now, six years from now, then I'm really alone. That's right. And then the other thing that I recognize, which helped me so much to sort of get through that yuckiness, is that our, I was starting to get into a really negative place and thinking about all our fights, because we all have them and That's we right. all get Every triggered. Couple. But what was a terrible thing remembering fights and a wonderful thing about remembering our fights is what I realized is that 90% of our fights now compared to 10 years ago or you know, other times before EFT are about the issue of what each of us are doing to keep each other at a distance. That's that right. we hate that disconnect. So we're right. arguing and fighting with each other. How dare you do that to keep us not close? And me doing the same thing. So the fight is actually not a good, bad fight. That's it's right. a wonderful fight. Yeah, we're and fighting that's over a- closeness and distance <laughs> rather than content about the laundry or the kids or paying right. the bills. And we are doing well, right? Right. And you I know? just sat there and I said, God, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Yes. How did I ever find someone that I could really want to be this close to well you revealed something in this that story you just shared it's so powerful and a great lesson and for anyone who tends to be emotionally withdrawn male or female it it sounds to me that as you were dropping your daughter off as she's launching into her adulthood and you were you were letting yourself feel both the joy and the sadness of that Right. The joy that she's grown up and she's successful enough to get into a college and she's going to go there and make friends and learn new things and come into herself even more. And sad that that means her childhood's really over. Right. And I think a lot of us avoid this. Right. We try to live pain free lives. But really, life is full of joy and pain. And I think the capacity to feel one is correlated to the capacity to feel the other. And marriage so much of the benefit of having a life partner is we get to feel these joys and pains together and we take turns you know sometimes i'm feeling yours and sometimes you're feeling mine and sometimes it's our pain maybe our child's sick maybe you know one of our parents is dying and i got really close to your dad and so i'm mm-hmm. sad too right. but to lean into that is to create the possibility that marriage becomes this this place where we get to not be alone in life, right? Mm. That that what you're talking about, I think that's your mission is that we share is let's eliminate unnecessary aloneness. Right. And alienation. And eliminate, yeah. Reduce loneliness, reduce alienation, and start in the closest relationship if you're a person in a committed relationship to your partner, start there. And then it generalizes. That's the magic. I see people And they can do this with their partners, they can do it with their kids, they can do it with their friends, and they become like connection catalysts that go out into the world and they're helping people connect. This world needs this. Empathy is what's going to keep, you know, save us. Lack of empathy will kill us. As a species, we have too much power not to have empathy, right? So, all right. Jim, thank you you very, very much for coming on. I think my listeners and my community really have benefited from your wisdom. I want to just really, again, reiterate something I said in my introduction, because I think you've lived it through our talk today. Just you share so much of yourself and you give so much to those that you care about that I think that it's one of the things in the joys, I think, that I've had from getting involved with this community and the EFT community is how open we all are of sharing our own lives, sharing our own also struggles, and how as a human race and a human being that connection and love and togetherness really can change the world. I, right. I mean, it's, it sounds all so... All you need is that's love. That's right. All love, you need love is, is all love. That would be my new theme song. All so, you so, need let is me, love. Let me say in closing, I really appreciated <laughs> sure. this. And it's fun. And I think you're doing a good thing. And maybe I come back down the road and we'll, we'll have another conversation. It's, it's a delight to talk to you. And I will say thank you for that compliment. I do seek to be vulnerable and be present. I want to open hearts and inspire growth. And I have to humbly say that my wife was talking to through me today. 
my wife, my, my best friend, my brother, so many people, my clients. See, that's the thing. When we open our heart, we learn this secret that the heart's capacity is unlimited. When we bring other people into us in a vulnerable way, we become stronger. All the therapy and the training and the speaking that I do is so much a reflection of my bond with my wife, both the security, but also the experiences with her and the knowing that she has my back no matter what. And the purpose and the, the, the joy I get knowing that she feels the same way. I, I'll close with one of the best things that happened to me this year. My wife wrote me a really nice little top 10 thing one time when we were, I was just having a really hard week and it was top 10 things I like about you. Mm-hmm. And the number 10 one was at the end of the list was you're the world's best kisser. <laughs> I have always thought and never been able to say to my wife that I think she's the world's best kisser and that I hold her back. And when I read that she thought I was, I melted inside. That's the kind of stuff you get to have when you create a secure relationship. And an ability to say that to your to wife, each to each other, face to face. And I think that's the power of love. Yeah. That's the power of human beings who are willing to open themselves up to another human being and let them in. And thank you again, Jim. Thank you, sir. And take care. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Thanks for listening to today's episode with your host, Stuart Fensterheim. You're one step closer to reigniting that fiery passion with your partner. For more information and your 30-minute free phone consultation with Stuart, visit www.thecouplesexpertscottsdale.com. We'll see you next time.